Before we start, we want to let Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners know that this episode contains the names and descriptions of people who have passed. We'll also be discussing the mistreatment of Aboriginal people and colonial violence. So please take care when listening. Welcome to Cake the Podcast, the podcast about cake from State Library of Queensland. This is the show that unravels the sweet and not so sweet stories behind our favourite desserts to understand how we got here. I'm your host, Caitlin Sorey, and in today's episode, we're visiting the community of Sherberg. It's a former mission and home to the Ration Shed Museum, and we're here to learn what sweet treats you can make from rations, which for a long time is what the Aboriginal people in this community survived of. It's amazing how many people don't know what happened on this community. It's just mind blowing. As you drive into Sherberg, you're welcomed by a big sign that says many tribes, one community. Both of my sisters here and the other ladies are here. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. After a long drive through wide open country, my co-producer Frank and I arrive in the car park behind the Ration Shed Museum. Janelle recruits us to bring in some bags because she's come prepared. I just bought my air fryer oh, nice. in case the oven don't work here. <laughs> Smart. But I've made scones and cupcakes in the air fryer and they turn out very fluffy and nice. Oh. Arnie Janelle brings us into an old Queenslander. Come in. So we won't be sewing today. <laughs> a group of ladies are gathered around a table. Art projects cover the walls right up to the ceiling. Janelle disappears into the kitchen and I meet Arnie Shirley. This is normally the sewing group. It is. So what do you guys normally sew? We sew anything and everything. Sometimes we have a special project here, you know, dedicated to our mums, and we donate it to the hospital. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, yeah. It's very soothing and it's very good. It's like meditation. Oh, it is. Yes. And, you know, sometimes we don't get much sewing done. As you can tell. Oh, that's very surprising. Oh, yes. 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 Over the next two days, the aunties of the Many Threads group are giving us some inside tips on two of their favourite treats, fried scones and damper. I bought the soup. Yep. So I think Daisy's making scones. Fried scones. I haven't had fried scones. Oh, you wait till you taste them, girl. While fried scones and damper might not be cake in the traditional sense, it's what they could make from rations and helps tell a much bigger story of what it was like to grow up on the Sherberg mission, where children were separated from their families, sent out to work as domestic servants, and spent every day living within the restrictions of mission life. Through it all, damper and scones were a staple. How do you remember them being made when you were a kid? Oh my God, well there's 10 of us kids. Well, you know, you just lived on damper and scones really. You know, to feed a big family. Well, we grew up on that. Yeah, damp and the scones were very satisfying. Really filled you up. You will find out later. (laughs) What was Sherberg like when you were a kid? Oh, my God. It was so great. We just had the best childhood here. How can I describe it? We had a lot of older people living here and they looked after all the children here. We felt we were safe, I should put it. Yes. And it was lovely. This is our home. Growing up as a mission kid meant food options were slim, but necessity is the mother of invention. I learned to cook from my mum, but, you know, every lady here, they've got their own special recipe. Daisy might put uh, milk in ears. My mum used to put powdered milk in ears. Yeah, a bit different, but, oh, it tasted lovely. Do you have a specific memory of all the family? We just felt so warm. Just seeing Mum by the stove, you know, we felt so privileged. You know what I mean? And very happy to have our Mum there, always cooking for us. Yes. Now you're making me hungry. Well, we'd better go and see what they're cooking. (laughs) Back in the kitchen, Arnie Daisy, one of three sisters here today, is in full swing, getting the fried scones mixture together. Hi. Oh, hi there. Do you okay. want to find recording? Is that okay? Yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just put some flour, milk and salt in the bowl and mix it all up. And then I'm going to cut them up into squares and I'm going to fry it in the fry pan. 
A group of aunties and I watch as the squares of scone mixture slowly turn golden brown and puff up in the electric frying pan. It's looking delicious. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to wait till it's all cooked now. Who taught you the recipe? My mum. Yep, yep. Yeah, my mum did, yeah. Did she do it with a cooker like this? No. no. She wouldn't have cooked now. Fry pan on the stove, on the old wood stove. The wood stove, that was literally building a little fire on the hot plate. Uh, yes, yeah, cast iron old stove. Mm. Yes, way back when we were small, yes. 70 something years ago. Wow. Arnie Daisy, happy with the finished result, brings a plate piled high with fluffy golden brown fried scones to the table. Totally, let's do it. Yay! Now, you've probably eaten scones before. But the ladies all agree. There are rules around the correct way to eat a fresh scone. We break it. Never put a knife through it. When it's warm, always break it. Why? Well, I don't know. That was what we were told. That's what I say to my children. You don't cut the damper when it's hot. Or the scones, we break it. Unlike regular scones, these have a lightly toasted shell that gives them a crunch. They are so good, Aunty Daisy. They're yummy, yes. Thank you, dear. Mm. One of the reasons that fried scones are a specialty here is that it was one of the things that could be easily made with rations, which is what Aunty Daisy and the other ladies grew up on. We was only talking about that the other day. We used to go down the ration shed to get our supplies every Monday. We used to get, what we used to get? Tea, sugar, flour, rice. Rolled oats. Porridge, yeah. Hey, treacle, yeah, and that was on a Friday. The bones we used to get, that was on a Friday. But getting the Russians home wasn't always straightforward. We was up that right up that end of town, and we used to have to walk all the way over the ration shed was over there. And my old father made a little go kart. I was talking about that little trolley. My old dad made Myra. You remember that little trolley? Well, we was better than a lot of families. They used to carry it on their back, I suppose. But, yeah, my old father was smart enough to make something for us because we had to go down and get the thing anyway, you know, while he was at work. All of the women here had to do a lot of jobs around the house when they were kids because their parents were always working. To understand Sherberg, you have to understand how it functioned as a government-controlled labour camp. When you come to the Ration Shed Museum, your first stop on the tour is the Ration Shed itself. The wooden walls of the shed are lined with the photos of the families that came here to survive. In a corner, there's a row of tea chests that would have held rations. And in the centre of the room, 30 or so folding chairs and a projector. This movie is about our shared histories here, what happened in Sherbrooke, what happened in Queensland, what happened in the whole of Australia of our hidden histories. Natasha Duncan, one of the tour guides here, sets us up with a bit of a warning of what we're about to see. It is a slap you in the face sort of movie. If you do get upset, just take a moment outside and come back in. The barbaric treatment of First Nations people in Sherbrooke is confronting. In 1897, the Queensland government passed the Aboriginals Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act, which brought First Nations people under the direct control of government. A couple of years later, a Salvation Army missionary set up a reserve to save the souls of Aboriginal people. More concerned with spiritual salvation than physical health, conditions in the camp were bad. In 1904, it was taken over by the government, and people from all around Queensland were forcibly removed from their homelands and moved to Sherbrooke. In some cases, people were force-marched over weeks to the camp. The early days of the settlement were particularly harsh. People lived in humpies and survived off meagre rations. John Webber, the Queensland politician at the turn of the century, denounced the system, saying, The bill made them absolute slaves. They could do nothing without protectors, and protectors could do just as they liked. And, as the settlement grew, so did its restrictions. Chief Protector Bleakley commented, If the remnants of the race are to be saved, they will have to be civilised. What this really meant was the obliteration of traditional culture. 
other government-run missions in Queensland had failed within a few years. But the new superintendent was determined that this reserve would be a success. From its inception, labour was the main focus of life in the settlement. Residents were forced to work at the settlement. This work mostly included scrub clearing, shepherding, fencing and dairy work, while females were engaged in domestic service. Inmates of the settlement were forced to work under threat of strict disciplinary measures. Those not willing to work suffered a number of punishments, including incarceration into the settlement's jail, a restriction of rations, physical abuse and exile to far-removed settlements. As horrendous as this must have been, as mission kids, most of the women in the Many Threads group were lucky enough to grow up in their homes with their parents, like Arnie Shirley. We felt so privileged, you know what I mean, to have our mum there. But this wasn't the case for everyone. Many of the children in Sherberg would be taken from their families and forced to live in the dormitories. Explain to me the split in the community between mission kids in Sherberg and dormitory kids. If you were a dormitory kid, it was like being in a prison in a prison. So the legislation for a reserve like Sherberg called all of the people that lived here inmates. So being on a reserve, you were an inmate. But then if you lived in the dormitories, there was barbed wire fences and curfews that separated you from associating with the rest of the um, community, with the mission kids. This is Bronwyn Tipman. Growing up in Sherberg's sister town, Mergen, meant she wouldn't learn about her family's history in the dormitories until she was in her teens. My nan was in the dormitory. I'd be happy to take you up and take you through. So where are we? This is the boys' dormitory building, the original building in the original position. It is also the very last dormitory surviving in all the Aboriginal reserves in Queensland. Wow, what happened to the rest of them? Well, for hours, one had to be demolished and then one had an arson attack on it. I suppose because of uh, the emotion that was attached to the plaque here at the front on the rock. It says, 1904 to 2004, the plaque honours all those children who were removed from family and culture and were detained in dormitories for years. In many cases, they were denied love and the guidance of cultural wisdom. We will always remember them. The old dormitory looks like a very long Queenslander, kind of like a community hall. So this is like a giant room. So there just would have been beds, 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 beds all the way along. This is a sleeping ward here. The youngest boys slept here because through that door was a little flat where the house parents lived. So they obviously had the youngest ones closest at hand. So house parents were Aboriginal people who were hired? Yes, yeah. They were selected. People of good standing, members of the church, handpicked by the superintendent. They often had their own families, like one of the families, this gentleman here, Jack O'Chin. So it's a little bit of a sad story. His first wife passed away and he had four children who were then taken off of him and put into the dormitories, the two girls and the two boys. He remarried and started a new family. So then him and Auntie Nelly ended up having nine or ten children of their own. But he never forgot about his children from his first marriage. And so for many years he advocated, advocated, advocated and asked if he could become a house parent. So So he could be in the dormitory with his kids. At least with his boys. He never got to be with his girls because this was the boys' dormitory. Having to move into the dormitories to be able to see your kids hits Frank hard. It's really... It's as amazing as it is really heartbreaking the lengths people had to go to just to live normal lives with their family. To try to keep their family together. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. Um, Fortunately, it was very prevalent under this system. It was basically a judgment not on how good a parent you were. It was about the colour of your skin, straight up. The girls' dormitory and the single mother's dormitory were surrounded by barbed wire and guarded by native police guaranteeing their separation from the rest of the mission. There was this unreal situation of you could have had, and this was my family's story, my nan was in the single mother's quarters. She had a son in one, she had a daughter in the other. You know, here's this family unit that was all 
separated out. And certainly some of the former dormitory children have said they didn't even realise their mum was alive because they were told by the house parents, oh, your mum's dead. And she could have been next door in the mother's quarters. The women who were sent to live in the single mother's quarters weren't always single. If the superintendent decided he didn't approve of your marriage, he could deny it, which is what happened to Bronwyn's grandmother. Her two eldest children were born out of wedlock and the superintendent at the time wouldn't allow her to marry her childhood sweetheart. So each time she fell pregnant, she had to stay in the single mother's quarters then. When her children were old enough, they were taken off of her. One was put in the girls' dormitory, one was put in the boys' dormitory and she'd get sent out to work on a station again. It was just a labour hire scheme really. It was really hard. The superintendent at the time saw himself as something of a matchmaker. And then one day she was summoned to the superintendent's office here and told she was marrying Dudley Collins, who's my paternal grandfather. She didn't have a choice in that. And she says, I didn't even like him at school. <laughs> she used to say that he loved her and he was smitten with her. But she certainly didn't have a choice in that marriage. Her two eldest children then stayed in the dormitories and my nan and pa went on to have four children in that marriage. And everybody lived with that hanging over their head that your kids could be taken off of you. The marriage fell apart or, or she got permission to be able to leave that marriage. Then she became a house parent in the dormitory, so life went full circle for my nan. As you get to the back of the dormitory, you move forward in Sherberg's history and find that despite the state controlling every facet of life in this community, the talent and fortitude of the people couldn't be contained. It's a sort of a deliberate choice as we, we wield your way through here. We've come to this section, the sporting heroes, the history, and we could have five buildings full of that. So one of the equalisers for the people in, in Shebeck was their natural sporting ability and their talent, and it ha- was one of the only reasons they were allowed to leave the, the mission was to go and compete in sporting um, competitions. So this is a snapshot of just a few of the wonderful champions. That's Eddie Gilbert. He was a very famous Aboriginal cricket player. Fast bowler Eddie Gilbert was best known for bowling Donald Bradman for a duck. And there's a torch from the Sydney Olympic Games. And the person who lit the cauldron was Geoffrey Mitter. He was a boxer from here who was the first Aboriginal sportsman to win a gold medal at the Commonwealth Games. And the community didn't just produce sporting legends. This gentleman, Vincent Serico, he was a dormitory boy. He's a very celebrated Aboriginal artist. Yeah, it's beautiful. beautiful. That painting and those colours. Mm. But of all the Sherberg heroes, one stands out. The bridge when you come into Sherberg is named after this gentleman here, Frank Big Shot Fisher. And he's Cathy Freeman's grandfather. Really? Yes. Frank Big Shot Fisher was a sporting double threat, a star cricket player and the captain of the local rugby team. In the 1930s, he twice played rugby against the Brits. The English captain said he was the best player he'd come up against and tried to poach him to play in England. However, the superintendent and the chief protector didn't allow him to go. He got picked and then the superintendent said no. That's how a legislation, a law how other people can just change the course of your life. And while the Ration Shed Museum tour ends by highlighting the heroes of Sherberg, so much of the history inside these four walls is painful. That emotion attached to many of these buildings and this, this area. You were told, don't go down there near that white picket fence because you'll come to the attention of the authorities, you know. The jails were down here. Like the dormitories all had their own jails. Like the girls' dormitory had its own little jail. There was a men's jail, there was a women's jail, there was a boys' jail. It's been a big battle to get our own mob to come in here and reclaim these spaces. There's been lots of healing sessions. There's all sorts of truth-telling that's happened. And some people won't come here and you can't blame them. But as vehicles to share this history with the wider world, um, we're proud to have the legacy to look after them. Yeah, it's amazing this is the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No pressure. (laughs) The next day, we come back into town because it's damper day, cooked by none other than Bronwyn's Aunty Vera. You know, we were talking about the boys' dorm yesterday. My nan that I was talking about, she was a house parent when it was the children's shop. After the dormitory was shut down in 1982, a couple of years later, the building became a children's shelter and operated until 2005. How how long were you a house parent? Forever. (laughs) 
we had a fireplace in here and I used to get up four in the morning and light the fire and then when it was time for all the little ones to get up, oh, man, it's so, so warm, do we have to go to school? <laughs> Being a house parent in the children's shelter, as well as having your own children, means Aunty Vera has made a lot of damper in her time. Tell me about your damper process. It's only flour, milk. Oh, I've got to go get the powdered milk. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll play with the flour. <laughs> While Bron finds the milk, we keep baking. When do you make damper? When the church wants some, or when we've got a big mob coming. Mm. So you're just popping a bunch of flour on the countertop so it doesn't yeah. stick. And how yeah. much flour have you put in the bowl? You've put quite a lot. I don't know. Probably half a packet? Yeah, about half. Not too much salt. Eh? Just a little bit of salt. The powdered milk arrives, but there's a problem. Is there a date on you? Uh, for 26 March 2019, yeah, it's out of date. I'm sure it's fine, no. So then when we have lunch, <laughs> we're all on the floor. This, okay. is, this is a secret society. <laughs> we're bound together. Add a bit of water. And then you um, fold it over. Mm-hmm. You punch the dough. <laughs> punch the dough. So you're kind of rolling it in from the outside and pushing it into the middle and punching yep. it in. Yep. And then Arnie Vera lines a pan with margarine and presses the dough into the pan. That's how you get that beautiful, even shape. So that's all I do with mine. Mm. Uh, so I need to put the timer on for an hour now. While we're waiting for the damper to rise, we go take a seat in the sun. And Arnie Vera tells me she never would have used that much flour for damper back in the day. Did you get enough flour to, to feed everyone? Not really. We had to make it go around. I still make sure that there's enough for the next, you know, next lot of rations. Mm. So you had to be pretty careful with how much you're making? Yeah. Almost to the end, you know, you had to you know, slow down a bit. Arnie Vera helped a lot around the house. As the oldest girl of 13 kids, she had a lot of responsibility on her shoulders. But soon enough, she was sent away from home. How old were you when you first got sent away? I finished year seven, and that's when they sent us out. So maybe 12, 13? Yeah, I think it was 13. There was two of us. We went together. We didn't even know where we were going. They put us on a train and we had to get off the train and we had to sit there and wait till the next day. We both looked at each other when we got off the train and I said, what now? She said, well, we just have to stay here. And we was we were scared. We were scared because there's nowhere to sleep. There's only a seat. But there's one lady, she come past, an Aboriginal lady, and she said, hello, who are you? What's your name? And... We told her our name and she reckoned they expect you to sleep here and then catch the train again tomorrow. That lady, she got us and took us to the, to the pub and got us a room upstairs and gave us a good sleep. And then the next day we went out to Quilpy to one of the stations where they had the, all the sheep, you know, and I stayed there for about eight months. Out in the station, Aunty Vera would be working from sunup to sundown, chasing after the station's four kids, cooking and cleaning. You see that polished floor in there? That's what I did on my knees. <sighs> the work meant Aunty Vera's days were hard, but it was the stories about what happened to girls sent out to work that made her nights fearful. But some of the ladies who end up in the single mother's quarters, yeah. had they been sent out to work and then come back with a baby? It did happen to people. And I had to come home. Alone and worried about the jackaroo next door, Aunty Vera found a way to feel safe. The bloke, the jackaroo, was a nice person. You know, I, I just said hello. Um, I didn't make a conversation or anything, but I was scared. So there was a cupboard there. 
I used to push the cupboard up to the door every night. You locked the door so they couldn't get in? Oh, yeah, I locked it all wrong. You're so young to worry about something like that. Oh, yeah, I was scared because I was scared because my mother and father wasn't there. I've seen other people go away and then, you know, when you get to meet them again, they'll talk about what happened. Eventually, Aunty Vera ended up being sent back to Sherberg and she ended up becoming a house parent in the children's shelter in the old dormitory building. It was sad, you know, but we we really looked after them like they was ours, you know. Some of them, you know, you can hear them crying at night. Yeah, you try your best. And Damper and Scones was one way she knew she could show them some love. The children would say, oh, what are we having for tea tonight, Nan? And if we're not making fried scones or damper, they go, oh, oh, they really like that. Bronwyn pops her head out of the kitchen. They're all winging down there. Oh, why? What are we having morning tea? I said, we're going to have it all together. I said, we'll wait for Caitlin and Annie Weir. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we better get a rig on. You have a look. Oh, that looks great. The secret might be a can of powdered milk that's out of date. (laughs) Aunty Vera shares a tip to knowing when the damper is actually ready. So I've got to turn it over. Oh, you turn it over? Right. I didn't didn't know that part. And gives the damper a knock. Then that says I'm cooked. Once the damper sounds just right, it's time for morning tea. We come with damper. But we can't get stuck in just yet. There's more rules. Annie Colleen tells us you're not supposed to rip open a damper when it's piping hot. So it's got to stay up next to the wall. And, it, yeah, you've got to let the air go through it so that it'll be nice and light to eat it. I think that was the mistake I was always making. So oh. I just open it up and be like, come. Yeah, no, <laughs> because it's hot seeing it, it's, it'll sweat and then it'll get all damp inside and then you, you won't have a nice damper. You don't want a damp damper. No, no, you don't want a damp damper. <laughs> like Aunty Vera, Aunty Colleen was also sent out to work really young. As we sit down at the table, it brings memories flooding back. I went out there when I was 12, 13 years old because I was 11 years old when my mother died and uh, the superintendent here talked to my eldest brother and said, Colleen's got to go out noon 11. And I was out there till I was uh, 18 years old. You stayed out there all that time? I stayed out there all that time. While Arnie Colleen was away working, all her money was being sent back to the mission, which meant she rarely had cash on her. When I used to have a days off or something or a holiday, they used to send me home yeah, 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 because yeah. I had no money in my hand. I couldn't go and buy anything, so I had to come home. And Gwenny, my elder sister, used to give me all of my toiletries and all that type of thing. Even though her wages were supposed to be coming back to the mission, getting access to the money was impossible. Wow. So you're doing all that work yeah. and not getting paid? Yeah. When you went to the main office here to ask them for if you wanted any money, you know, and any cash... Oh, there's nothing here. We got no record of your money coming back here. That's why you had the stolen wages. That's what they was taking all our money and stolen generation. You hear about that, eh? And the stolen. That's what we went through all that. From 1904 through to the 1970s, Aboriginal people didn't have access to the money they thought they were earning. It was actually a woman from Sherberg named Leslie Williams who realised that the money so-called held in trust by the state was never coming back to her. So she took the Queensland government to the Supreme Court for stolen wages. It would take years, but she would win. Her case would trigger Queensland, New South Wales and Western Australia to start the reparations process. We did get a couple of payouts from stolen wages, so we can't... But not yeah, much, and they, not much, and they paid us some money a couple, few years ago for our mum and dads mm. when they worked all their years and got nothing. So, yeah, but really that's, that's not enough. The system of exploiting Aboriginal labour was so pervasive that it went all the way to the top. Arnie Colleen remembers what that meant for her dad. You know, when, when Bajolka Peterson was alive, eh? Mm-hmm. He was a Premier, eh? He used to come up here from his property in Kingaroy King with a truck and he used to pick up all our men and take him over there to work on his property so that he can get wealthy. Really? Yes. Yes. Yep. 
My father was one of them. <laughs> in the early days when Dad was young, they used to pick him up and he worked up on the cane farm, he worked up on the station, and then he worked on Bianca Peterson. What kind of work would you do for Bianca Peterson? Uh, picking up peanuts. Peanut, 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 peanut he had a peanut farm and I don't mm. know what else he had out mm. there, but yeah, yeah. Mm. He had a whole, whole lot of stuff there. But that's what they used to do. They used to use the black fellas to do all their work yeah. and make an out that they get paid and they never got they paid. They never got paid. Yeah. Mm. Slave labour, see? We don't really know where their money went, but we do know it didn't go to the people of Sherbrooke. People don't, need, don't know the history of the infrastructure in the state mm. and where, where that money went to. Mm. But I know where a lot of it went to. Let me tell you, where, where all our money went to. They built the Mirrorborough Hospital. Mm. They built the Red Cliff Hospital. Well, that's where all the money went to. Out there in the white community, nothing hospital. for us. Nothing for mm. us in the community. We had nothing. Mm. And we find all this out later on in life, you mm. know, mm. and make you. Mm. But somehow, the community made the best of it. But going back to what the reason why we're here today and you're doing sewing and cooking, mm. our, our parents, our mothers were masters of it. Oh, definitely. They were masters. Yeah. Um, because they had to. The restrictions on their lives meant their parents had to find ingenious ways around the system. Mum had vegetables, they grew uh, fruit trees, passion fruits, you know, gooseberries, everything. Mum had everything there. She had ducks, she had chooks, she had goats. And then when we used to run out of food, Dad used to go bush. Kangaroo, possum, emus, whatever, to bring bring home. Wichity grubs all home for mum to, to cook to make us so that we had proper vitamins in our body. So that's the way they did, you know. They couldn't go to the corner shop and buy things. So they had to do with what they did with the rations. Mum had 12 kids, so she got 12 cups of rice, 12 cups of sugar, 12 cups of tea and things like that, you see. And if that ran out, stiff titty, you had to do with what you can. You couldn't get off this mission you couldn't go anywhere to get what you want to, to survive. You had to make do with what was here. Because if you were found outside the boundaries, you were put in jail. I'm her now. Arnie Colleen's memories of hunting and making do remind her of how the system tried to break her dad. My father was a, a bushman. He always had dog to go and get a mm. porcupine, a dog for a goanna or whatever, mm. go hunting. He had six dogs. That was how his livelihood, see, that's what he did for his family. Mm. I get upset when I talk about my father because he'd come home from work once, they killed all his dogs. Oh. oh. They killed them all. What happened? Oh. Mm. oh. So of course he was. And he grabbed upset. his rifle and he said he's going to come down and shoot the superintendent because mm. he killed his dogs. Yeah. And they, so oh, they put him in, they put him in a straitjack and they sent him to the nut house. Well, he was there for police. He was there for a couple of years, yeah. Really? He ended up with shock treatment and everything. Oh, and then my goodness. When he came back, he wasn't the same, poor dad. Yeah. But he would, they called him a troublemaker. But, I mean, you know, on, on the other hand, too, I mean, we had good times here when we were children. Mm. Yeah. We, we had fantastic yeah. times, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't but, be what we are today. Bronwyn suddenly notices we haven't touched our damper yet. I'm going to say, Frank and Caitlin, put your microphones down, Mm -hmm. get some damper and have something to eat. Yeah, 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 yeah. you haven't got to eat. eat. (laughs) And Nicola Tizard, the manager of the Ration Shed Museum, jumps in with a few words. I just want to, on behalf of the Ration Shed, say thank you so much for coming up. It's quite emotional and emotive to hear these stories. Mm -hmm. And a very lovely surprise. I bet you can't guess what this is. Nicola presents us with a beautiful bag of little knitted baby's clothes. Oh, isn't it cute? Oh, look at that. How tiny it is. Oh, God. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Oh. So cute. The only issue is I don't think any of that's going to fit me. <laughs> you will be back. You'll be like, you'll be back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Maybe next time I'm baby. Yeah, that's right. Maybe auntie's to hold the baby here. As we leave Sherberg, I'm inspired by the love and generosity in this community. After two days, it feels like we've only just scratched the surface. You need to be here for four months to hear all the different stories. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's why I love being a part of Many Threads. Despite the hard history here, the people of Sherberg have created something beautiful. They share through family and food to make a better place. And that's what our next episode is all about. 
Whether it's surviving floods or how baking can help neurodivergent kids keep calm, we'll be looking at how cakes can help bake a better place. Be useful for help grounding you in your body and you're you're just working on what you're working on in the moment no judgment it helps focus your mind you're not caught up in you know the past or thinking about the future you're just focusing on the present like any good cake cake the podcast is best when shared leave a review and subscribe to show the love cake the podcast is an f and k production made for state library of queensland